Welcome to my book nook. Welcome back to my book nook. We're almost in the middle of The Memory Keeper's Daughter um, by Kim Edwards. And we're all the way to May of 1965. And yes, I am going to use the readers again because they do, they do help. I hate to admit that, but there we are. <laughs> all right. Nora was, a fr was ahead of him, moving like light, flashes of white denim amid the trees there and then, a and then gone. David followed, leaning down now and then to pick up stones, rough-skinned geodes, fossils etched in shell, once an arrowhead. He held each of these for a moment, pleased by their weight and shape, by the coolness of the stones against his palm before he had slipped them into his pockets. As a boy, the shelves of his room had always been littered with stones, and to this day he couldn't pass them up. Their mysteries and possibilities, even though bending was awkward with Paul in a carrier against his chest and the camera scraping against his hip. Far ahead, Nora paused to wave, then seemed to vanish straight into a wall of smooth gray stone. Several other people wearing matching blue baseball caps spilled suddenly one by one from this same gray wall. As David drew closer, he realized that the stairway leading to the natural stone bridge rose up there, just out of sight. Better watch your step, a woman descending warned him. It's steep like you wouldn't believe, slippery too. Breathless, she paused and held her hand on her heart. David, noting her paleness, her shortness of breath, paused. Ma'am, I'm a doctor. Are you all right? Palpitation, she said, waving her free hand. I've had them all my life. He took her plump wrist and felt her pulse, swift but steady, slowing as he counted. Palpitations. People use the term freely to talk about any quickening of the heart, but he could tell at once that the woman was in no real distress. Not like his sister, who had grown breathless and dizzy and was forced to sit any time she so much as ran across the room. Heart trouble the doctor in Morgantown had said, shaking his head. He had not been more specific, and, and it had not mattered. There was nothing he could do. Years later, in medical school, David had remembered her symptoms and read late into the night to make his own diagnosis, a narrowing of the aorta and maybe an abnormality of the heart valve. Either way, June had moved slowly and fought to breathe, her condition worsening as the years passed, her skin pale and faintly blue in the months before she died. She had loved butterflies and standing with her face turned to the sun, eyes closed and eating homemade jelly on the thin saltines her mother bought in town. She was always singing, made up tunes she hummed softly to herself, and her hair was pale, almost white, the color of buttermilk. For months after she died, he had woken in the night thinking he'd heard her small voice, singing like the wind in the pines. You said you've had this all your life, he asked the woman, gravely releasing her hand. Oh, always, she said. The doctors tell me it's not serious, just annoying. Well, I think you'll be fine, he said, but don't push yourself too hard. She thanked him, touched Paul's head, and said, You watch out for that little one now. David nodded and moved off, protecting Paul's head with his free hand as he climbed between the damp stone walls. He was pleased. It was so good to be able to help people in need, to offer healing, something he could not seem to do for those he loved the most. Paul patted softly at his chest, grabbing at the at the envelope he had stuffed in his pocket. A letter from Caroline Gill, delivered that morning to his office. He'd read it only once, swiftly putting it away as Nora came in, trying to conceal his agitation. We are well, Phoebe and I, it had said. So far, she does not have any problems with her heart. Now he caught Paul's small fingers in his own, gently. His son looked up, wide-eyed, curious, and he felt a deep, swift rush of love. Hey, David said, smiling, I love you, little guy, but don't eat that, okay? Paul studied him with wide, dark eyes, then turned his head and rested his cheek against David's chest, radiating warmth. He wore a white hat with yellow ducks that Nora had embroidered in the quiet, watchful days after her accident. With the emergence of each duck, David had breathed a little easier. He'd seen her grief. The space it had left in her heart when he had developed the spent roll of film in his new camera, room after empty room in their old house, close-ups of window frames, the stark shadows of the stairwells, the floor tiles skewed and crooked and Nora's footprints, those erratic, bloody trails. He'd thrown the photos out, negatives and all, but they still haunted him. He was afraid they always would. He had lied, after all. He had given away their daughter. That terrible consequences that would follow seemed both inevitable and just. But days had passed, now nearly three months, and Nora seemed to be 
herself again. She worked in the garden or laughed on the telephone with friends or lifted Paul from his playpen with her lean, graceful arms. David watched, told himself she was happy. Now the ducks bounced cheerfully with every step, catching the light as David emerged from the narrow stairs onto the natural stone bridge spanning the gorge. Nora, wearing denim shorts and a sleeveless white blouse, stood in the center of the bridge, the toes of her white sneakers flush with the rocky edge. Slowly, with the dancer's grace, Nora opened her arms and arched her back, eyes closed as if offering herself to the sky. "'Nora!' he called out, appalled. "'That's dangerous!' Paul pushed his small hands against David's chest. Do, he echoed when he heard David say dangerous. A baby word applied to electrical outlets, stairs, fireplaces, chairs, and now to this sheer drop to the earth so far below his mother. It's spectacular, Nora called back, letting her arms fall. She turned, causing pebbles to skid beneath her feet and slide over the edge. Come see! Cautiously, he walked out onto the bridge and went to stand beside her at the edge. Tiny figures moved slowly on the path far below, where an ancient river had once rushed. Now hills rolled away into lush spring, a hundred different shades of green against the clear blue sky. He took a deep breath, fighting a wave of vertigo, afraid even to glance at Nora. He had wanted to spare her, to protect her from loss and pain. He had not understood that loss would follow her regardless, as persistent and life-shaping as a stream of water. Nor had he anticipated his own grief, woven with the dark threads of his past. When he imagined the daughter he had given away, it was his sister's face he saw, her pale hair, her serious smile. Let me get a picture, he said, taking one slow step back, then another. Come over to the middle of the bridge. The light's better. In a minute, she said, her hands on her hips. It's just so beautiful. Nora, he said, you're really making me nervous. Oh, David, she said, tossing her head without looking at him. Why are you so worried all the time? I'm fine. He didn't answer. Conscious of his lungs moving, the deep unsteadiness of his breathing, he had the same feeling when he opened Caroline's letter, addressed to his old office in her scraggy hand, half covered with a forwarding stamp. It was postmarked Toledo, Ohio. Ohio. She had included three pictures of Phoebe, an infant in a pink dress. The return address was to a P.O. box, not in Toledo, but in Cleveland. Cleveland? A place had never been, a place where Caroline Gill was apparently living with his daughter. Let's move away from here, he said again at last. Let me take your picture. She nodded, but when he reached the safe center of the bridge and turned, Nora was still near the edge, facing him, arms folded, smiling. Take it right here, she said. Make it look like I'm walking out on air. David squatted, filling with the camera dials, heat radiating up from the bare golden rocks. Paul squirmed against him and started to fuss. David would remember all this, which when went unseen and unrecorded when the image rose up later in the developing fluid taking slow shape he framed nora in the viewfinder wind moving in her hair her skin tan and healthy wondering at all she kept from him the spring air was warm softly fragrant and they hiked back down passing cave entrances and sprays of purple rhododendron and mountain laurel Nora led them off the main path and through the trees, following a creek until they emerged in a sunstruck place she remembered for its wild strawberries. Wind moved lightly in the long grass and the dark green leaves of the strawberry plants shimmered low against the earth. The air was full of sweetness, the hum of insects and heat. They spread out their picnic, cheese and crackers and clusters of grapes. David sat down on the blanket, cradling Paul's head against his chest as he undid the baby carrier thinking idly of his own father, stocky and strong, with skilled blunt fingers that covered David's hands as he taught him to heft an axe or milk the cow or pound a nail through cedar shingles. His father, who smelled of sweat and resin and the dark hidden earth of the mines where he worked in the winter. Even when David was a teenager boarding in town all week so he could go to high school, he had loved walking home on the weekend and finding his father there, smoking his pipe on the porch. Do, Paul said free. He immediately pulled off one shoe. He studied it intently, then dropped it almost at once and crawled off toward the grassy world beyond the blanket. David watched him yank a fistful of weeds and put them in his mouth, a look of surprise flashing across his small features at the texture. He wished, suddenly, fiercely, that his parents were alive to meet his son. Awful stuff, isn't it? He said softly, wiping grassy drool from Paul's chin. Nora moved beside him quietly, efficiently, taking out silverware and napkins. 
He kept his face turned. He didn't want her to see him so stirred by emotion. He took a geode from his pocket and Paul grasped it in both hands, turning it over. Should he have that in his mouth, Nora asked, settling down beside him. So close he could feel her warmth, her scent of sweat and soap filling the air. Probably not, he said, retrieving the stone and giving Paul a cracker instead. The geode was warm and damp. He gave it a sharp crack on the rock, splitting it open to reveal its crystalline purple heart. So beautiful, Nora murmured, turning it in her hand. Ancient seas, David said. The water got trapped inside and crystallized over centuries. They ate lazily, then picked ripe strawberries, sun-warmed and tender. Paul ate them by fistfuls, juice running down his wrists. Two hawks circled lazily in the deep blue sky. Dee Dee, Paul said, lifting a chubby arm to point. Later, when he fell asleep, Nora settled him on the blanket in the grassy shade. This is nice, Nora observed, settling back her with her back against a boulder. Just the three of us sitting in the sun. Her feet were bare, and he took them in his hands, massaging them, delicate bones hidden beneath the flesh. Oh, she said, closing her eyes, that's really nice. You'll put me to sleep. Stay awake, he said. Tell me what you're thinking. I don't know. I was just remembering this little field by the sheep farm. When Bree and I were little, we used to wait for our father there. We gathered huge bunches of black-eyed Susans and Queen Anne's lace. Queen Anne's lace, and the sun felt just like this, like an embrace. Our mother put the flowers and vases all over the house. That's nice, too, David said, releasing one of her feet and attending to the other. He ran his thumb lightly over the thin white scar the broken flashbulb had left. I like thinking of you there. Nora's skin was soft. He remembered sunny days from his own childhood before June got so sick, when the family had gone hunting for ginseng, a fragile plant hidden in the dusky light amid the trees. His parents had met on such a search. He had their wedding photo, and on the day of their own marriage, Nora had presented it to him in a handsome oak frame. His mother, with clear skin and wavy hair, a narrow waist, a faint, knowing smile. His father, bearded, standing beside her, his cap in his hand. They'd left the courthouse after the wedding and moved into the cabin his father had built on the mountainside overlooking their fields. My parents loved being outside, he added. My mother planted flowers everywhere. There was a cluster of jack in the pulpit by the stream up from her house. I'm so sorry I never met them. They must have been so proud of you. I don't know. Maybe. They were glad my life was easier. Glad. She agreed slowly, opening her eyes and glancing at Paul, who slept peacefully, dappled light falling on his face. But maybe a little sorry, too. I mean, I would be if Paul grew up and moved away. Yeah, he said, nodding. That's true. They were proud and sorry both. They didn't like the city. They only visited me once in Pittsburgh. He remembered them sitting awkwardly in his single stu student room, his mother starting every time a train whistle sounded. June was dead by then, and as they sat sipping weak coffee at the rickety student table, he remembered thinking bitterly that they did not know what to do with themselves without June to care for. She had been the center of all their lives for so long. They only stayed with me for one night, and after my father died, my mother went to live with her sister in Michigan. She wouldn't fly, and she never learned to drive. I only saw her once after that. That's too sad, Nora said, rubbing away a smear of dirt on her calf. Yeah, David said, too sad indeed. He thought of June, the way her hair got so blonde in the sun each summer, the scent of her skin, soap and warmth and something metallic like a coin, filling the air when they squatted side by side, digging up the ground with sticks. He had loved her so much, her sweet laughter, and he had hated coming home to find her lying on a pallet on the porch on sunny days. His mother's face drawn with concern as she sat beside her daughter's limp form, singing softly, husking corn or shelling peas. David looked at Paul, sleeping so deeply on the blanket with his head turned to the side, his long hair curling against his damp neck. His son, at least, he had sheltered from grief. Paul would not grow up as David had, suffering the loss of his sister. He could not be forced to fend for himself because his sister couldn't. This thought and the force of its bitterness shocked David. He wanted to believe he'd done the right thing when he handed his daughter to Caroline Gill, or at least that he'd had the right reason. Per but perhaps he had not. Perhaps it was not so much Paul he'd been protecting on that snowy night as some lost version of himself. You look so far away, Nora observed. 
He shifted, moving closer to her, leaning against the boulder too. My parents had great dreams for me, he said, but they didn't match my own dreams. Sounds like me and my mother, Nora said, hugging her knees. She says she's coming to visit next month. Did I tell you? She's got a free flight. That's good, isn't it? Paul will keep her busy. Nora laughed. He will, won't he? That's her whole reason for coming. Nora, what do you dream about, he asked. What do you dream for Paul? Nora didn't answer right away. I suppose I want him to be happy, she said at last. Whatever in life makes him happy. I want him to have that. I don't care what it is, as long as he grows up to be good and true to himself and generous and strong like his father. No, David said uncomfortable. You don't want him to take after me. She gave him an intent look, surprised. Why not? He didn't answer, and after a long, hesitant moment, Nora spoke again. What's wrong? she asked. Not aggressively, but thoughtfully, as if she were trying to puzzle out the answer as she spoke. Between us, I mean, David. He didn't answer, struggling against a sudden surge of anger. Why did she have to stir things up again? Why couldn't she just let the past rest and move on? But she spoke again. It hasn't been the same since Paul was born and Phoebe died. And yet you still won't talk about her. It's like you want to erase the fact that she existed. Nora, what do you want me to say? Of course... Of course, life hasn't been the same. Don't get angry, David. That's just some kind of strategy, isn't it? So I won't talk any about her anymore. But I won't back down. What I'm saying is true. He sighed. Don't ruin a beautiful day, Nora, he said at last. I'm not, she said, moving away. She lay down on the blanket and closed her eyes. I'm perfectly content with this day. He watched her for a moment, sunlight catching in her blonde hair, her chest rising and falling gently with each breath. He wanted to reach out and trace the delicate curved bones of her ribs. He wanted to kiss her at the point the bones met, stretching away like wings. Nora, he said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what you want. No, she said, you don't? You could tell me. I suppose I could, maybe I will. Were they very much in love? She asked suddenly without opening her eyes. Her voice was still soft and calm, but he was aware of a new tension in the air. Your father and your mother. I don't know, he said slowly, carefully trying to determine the source of her question. They loved each other, but he was away a lot. Like I said, they had hard lives. My father loved my mother more than she loved him, Nora said, and David felt an uneasiness stir in his heart. He loved her, but he couldn't seem to show love in a way that was meaningful to her. She just thought he was offbeat, a little silly. There was a lot of silence in my house growing up. We're pretty silent in our own house, too, she added, and, and he thought of their calm evenings, her head bent over the little white hat with the ducks. A good silence, he said. Sometimes. And other times? I still think about her, David, she said, turning on her side and meeting his gaze. Our daughter, what would she be like? He didn't answer, and as he watched, she wept silently silently, covering her face with her hands. After a moment, he reached out and touched her arm, and she wiped the tears from her eyes. And you, she demanded fierce now, don't you ever miss her too? Yes, he said truthfully. I think about her all the time. Nora put her hand on his chest, and then her lips, very stained, were on his, a sweetness as piercing as desire against his tongue. He felt himself falling, the sun on his skin and her breasts lifting softly like birds against his hands. She sought the buttons on his shirt and her hand brushed against the letter he had hidden in his pocket. He shrugged off his shirt, but even so, when he slid his arms around her again, he was thinking, I love you. I love you so much and I lied to you. And the distance between them, millimeters only, the space of a breath opened up and deepened, became a cavern and whose, at whose edge he stood. He pulled away back into the light and shadow the clouds over him and then not, and the sun warmed, rock hot against his back. What is it? she asked, stroking his chest. Oh, David, what's wrong? Nothing. David, she said, please, David. He hesitated on the edge of confessing everything, and then he could not. A problem from work. A patient. I can't get the case out of my mind. Let it go, she said. I'm sick and tired of your work. Hawks lifting high on the updrafts and the sun so warm. Everything circled, returning each time to the exact same point. He must tell her the words filled his mouth. I love you. I love you so much, and I lied to you. I want to have another baby, David, Nora said, sitting up. Paul's old enough now, and I'm ready. 
David was so startled he didn't speak for a moment. Paul's only a year old, he said at last. So? People say it's easier to get all the diapers and things over with at once. What people? She, she sighed. I knew you'd say no. I'm not saying no, David replied carefully. She didn't answer. The timing seems wrong, he said. That's all. You are saying no. You're saying no, but you don't want to admit it. He was silent, remembering the way Nora had stood so close to the edge of the bridge, remembering her photographs of nothing and the letter in his pocket. He wanted nothing more than for the delicate structures of their lives to remain secure, for things to continue just as they were, for the world not to change, for this fragile equilibrium between them to endure. Things are fine right now, he said softly. Why rock the boat? How about for Paul? She nodded him, sleeping still and peaceful on his blanket. He misses her. He can't possibly remember, David replied sharply. Nine months, Nora said, growing heart to heart. How could he not at some level? We're not ready, David said. I'm not. It's not about you, Nora said. You've hardly, you're hardly home anyway. Maybe it's me who misses her, David. Sometimes, honestly, I feel like she's so close, just in the other room. And I've forgotten her, and I know that must sound crazy, but it's true. He didn't answer, though he knew exactly what she meant. The air was thick with the scent of strawberries, and his mother had made preserves on the outdoor stove, stirring the foaming mixture as it cooked into syrup, boiling the jars, filling them to stand, jewel-like on a shelf. He and June had eaten the jam in the dead of winter, stealing spoonfuls when their mother wasn't looking and hiding under the table's oilcloth cover to lick them clean. June's death had broken their mother's spirit, and David could no longer believe himself immune from misfortune. It was statistically unlikely that they'd have another child with Down syndrome, but it was possible. Anything was possible, and he couldn't take the risk. But it wouldn't fix things, Nora, to have another baby. That's not the right reason. After a moment's silence, she stood up, brushing her hands on her shorts, and waved off angrily through the field. His shirt lay crumpled beside him, a corner of the white envelope visible. David did not reach for it. He did not need to. The note was brief, and though he had glanced at the photos only once, they were as clear to him as if he had taken them himself. Phoebe's hair was dark and fine like Paul's. Her eyes were brown, and she waved chubby fists in the air as if reaching for something beyond the camera's view. Caroline, perhaps wielding the camera. He had glimpsed her at the memorial service, tall and lonely in her red coat, and had gone straight to her apartment afterward, unsure of his intentions, knowing only that he had to see her. But by then Caroline was gone. Her apartment had looked exactly the same, with its squat furniture and plain walls. A faucet dripped in the bathroom, yet the air was too still, the shelves bare. The bureau, drawers, and closets were empty, and in the kitchen, a dull light pouring in across the black and white linoleum. David had stood listening to the beating of his own uneasy heart. Now he lay back, the clouds moving over him, light and shadow. He had not tried to find Caroline, and since her letter had no useful return address, he could not imagine where to start. It's in your hands now, he had told her. But he found himself stricken at odd moments, alone in his new office, or developing photos, watching images emerge mysteriously on the sheets of blank white paper, or lying here on this warm rock while Nora, hurt and angry, walked away. He was tired, and he felt himself drifting into sleep. Insects hum in the sunlight, and he felt faintly anxious about bees. The stones in his pockets pressed against his legs, nights in his childhood. He sometimes found his father on the porch rocker, the poplar trees glinting, alive with fireflies. On one such night, his father handed him a smooth stone an axe head had found while digging a trench. Over 2,000 years old, he said. Imagine that, David. It sat in other hands once, that eternally long ago, but beneath this very same moon. That was one time. There were other days when they went out to catch rattlesnakes and dust, dust to dawn. They'd walk through the woods, carrying forked sticks, cloth bags over their shoulders, and a metal box swinging from David's hand. It always seemed to David that time passed on those days. The sun forever in the sky and the dry leaves moving under his feet. The, that time paused on those days, sorry. The world was reduced to just himself and his father and the snakes, but it, it was expanded too. The sky opening vastly around him, higher and bluer with every step, and everything slowing down to the moment when he spotted a movement amid the colors of dirt and dry leaves, the diamondback pattern visible only when the snake began to move. His father had taught him how to grow still, watching the yellow eyes, the flickering tongue. Each time a snake shed its skin, the 
the rattle grew longer, so you could tell by the loudness of the rattle in the forest silence how old the snake was, how big, and how much money it would bring. For the largest ones coveted by zoos and scientists, and sometimes by snake handlers, they might receive five dollars apiece. Light fell through the trees and made patterns on the forest floor, and there was the sound of wind. There was the rattling and the rearing head of the snake in his father's arms, strong and solid, plunging a forked stick down to pin the snake by its neck. The fangs extended, striking hard into damp earth, the rattling wild and furious. With two strong fingers, his father gripped the snake tightly behind its open jaw and picked it up, cool, dry, writhing like a whip. He slung the snake into a cloth bag and jerked it shut, and then with the then the bag with a live thing quivering on the ground his father flipped in flipped it into a metal box and closed the lid without speaking they walked on counting the snake money in their minds they, they were weeks in the summer and late fall when they could make 25 dollars this way the money paid for food when they went to the doctor in morgantown it paid for that too david Nora's voice came to him faintly, urgently through the distant pass in the forest and into the day. He rose up on his elbows and saw her standing on the far edge of the field of ripening strawberries, transfixed by something on the ground. He felt a rush of adrenaline and fear. Rattlesnakes like, like sunny logs, like the one by which he had stopped. They laid their eggs in the fertile, rotting wood, and he glanced at Paul, still sleeping quietly in the shade. And then he was up and running, thistles scratching his ankles and strawberries bursting softly beneath his feet already reaching into the pocket of his jeans and closing his fist around the largest stone. When he got close enough to glimpse the dark line of the snake, he threw it as hard as he could. The dull stone arched slowly through the air, turning. It fell six inches short of the snake and burst open, his purple heart alive and glittering. What in the world are you doing? Nora asked. He'd reached her by then, panting. He looked down. It was not a snake at all, but a dark stick resting against the dry skin of the log. I thought you called me he said, confused. I did. She pointed to a cluster of pale flowers just beyond the line of shade. Jack in the pulpits, like your mother used to have. David, you're scaring me. I thought it was a snake, he said, gesturing to the stick, shaking his head once more to try to clear away the past. A rattlesnake. I was dreaming, I guess. I thought you needed help. She looked puzzled, and he shook his head to clear away the dream. He felt terribly foolish suddenly. The stick was a stick, and nothing more. The day seemed absurdly normal. Birds called out and the leaves began to move again in the trees. Why were you dreaming of snakes? she asked. I used to catch them, he said, for money. For money? she repeated, puzzled. Money for what? The distance was back between them, a chasm of the past that he could not cross. Money for food and for those trips into town. She came from a different world. She would never understand this. They helped to pay my way through school, those snakes, he said. She nodded and seemed about to, to ask more, but she did not. Let's go, she said, rubbing her shoulder. Let's just get Paul and go home. They walked back across the field and packed up their things. Nora carried Paul, he, the picnic basket. As they walked, he remembered his father standing in the doctor's office, green bills falling like leaves on the countertop. With each one, David remembered the snakes, the whipping of their rattles and the mouths opening in a futile V, the coolness of their skin beneath his fingers and their weight. Snake money. He was a boy, eight or nine, and it was one thing he could do. That and protect June. Watch your sister, his mother would caution, looking up from the stove. Feed the chickens, clean the coop, and weed the garden, and watch June. David did, though not well. He kept June in sight, but did not stop her from digging in the dirt and rubbing it through her hair. He didn't comfort her when she tripped over a rock and fell down, scraping her elbow. His love for her was so deeply woven with resentment that he could not untangle the two. She was sick all the time from her weak heart and from the cold she got in every season, which made her wheeze and gasp for breath. Yet when he came up from the path from school, with his books slung over his back, it was June who was always waiting. June, who looked into his face and understood what his day had been like, who wanted to know all about it. Her fingers were small and she liked to pat him, the breeze shifting her long, lank hair. And then one weekend, he came home from school to find the cabin empty and still, a wash rag hanging over the side of the tub and a chill in the air. He sat on the porch, hungry and cold, waiting. Very much later, near dusk, he glimpsed his mother walking down the hill with her arms folded. She did not speak until she reached the step, and she looked up at him and said, David, your sister died. June died. 
His mother's hair was pulled back tautly and a vein was pulsing in her temple and her eyes were so red-rimmed from crying. She wore a thin gray sweater pulled close and she said, David, she's gone. And when he stood and hugged her, she broke down weeping and he said, when? And she said, three days ago on Tuesday. It was early in the morning and I went outside to get some water and when I came back to the, ho the house was quiet and I knew right away she was gone. Stop breathing. He held his mother, and he could not think of anything more to say. The pain he felt was deep inside him, and above that was a numbness he could not cry. He put a blanket around his mother's shoulder, and he made her a cup of tea and went out to the hens and found the eggs she had not collected, and he gathered them. He fed the chickens and milked the cow. He did these ordinary things, but when he went inside, the house was still dim, the air still silent, and June still gone. Davy, his mother said a long time later from the shadows where she sat, you go off to school, learn something that could help in the world. He felt a resentment at that. He wanted his life to be his own, unencumbered by this shadow, this loss. He felt guilty because June was living in the earth with a mound of dirt over her and he was still standing here. He was alive and the breath moved in and out of his lungs and he could feel it in his heartbeat. I'll be a doctor, he said. And his mother didn't answer, but after a while she nodded and rose, pulling her sweater close again. Davy, I need you to take the Bible and go up there with me and say the words. I want the words said formally and right. And so they walked up the hillside together. It was dark by the time they got there, and he stood beneath the pines with the high wind whispering, and by the flickering light from the kerosene lamp he read, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But I want, he thought. And he spoke the words, I want. And his mother wept, and they walked silently down the hill to the house, where he wrote a letter to his father telling the news. He posted this on Monday when he went back to town with its bustle and bright lights. He stood behind the counter, the, own worn, the oak worn smooth by a generation of commerce, and dropped the plain white letter in the mill. When they finally reached the car, Nora paused to examine her shoulder, dark pink from the sun. She was wearing sunglasses. When she looked up, she could not read her expression. He could not read her expression. You don't have to be such a hero, she said. Her words were flat and practiced, and he could tell she'd been thinking about them, rehearsing them, perhaps during the walk back. I'm not trying to be a hero. No, she looked away. I think you are, she said. It's my fault, too. For a long time, I wanted to be rescued. I realized that, but not anymore. You don't have to protect me all the time now. I hate it. And then she took the car seat and turned away again. In the dappled sunlight, Paul's hand reached for her hair, and David felt a sense of panic, almost vertigo, at all he didn't know, at all he knew and couldn't mend. And anger, he felt that too, and suddenly in a great rush at himself, but also at Caroline, who had not done what he had asked, who had made an impossible situation even worse. Nora slid into the front seat and slammed the car door shut. He fished in his pocket for his keys and instead pulled out the last geode, gray and smooth, earth-shaped. He held it, warming it in his palm, thinking of all the mysteries the world contained, layers of stones concealed beneath the flesh of earth and grass. He stole rocks with their glimmering, hidden hearts. Holy cow, I love how she writes. That was beautiful and so sad, and I'm sorry. I hope you had the tissues ready. <laughs> um, our next episode will move forward five years, so be prepared. Have a great day.